of world news tonight. AI double. Imran Khan deploys AI clone to campaign from behind bars in Pakistan. Midnight horror. Rescuers battle sub-zero temperatures as more than 100 killed by China's deadliest quakes in nearly a decade. Fire and ice. Volcano erupts in Iceland's Rajakhan's peninsula weeks after towns were evacuated. And a magical Croatia. Five million colored lights bring Christmas cheer to a Croatian town. is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We begin this Tuesday night as protesters set a train ablaze in Bangladesh, killing at least four people amid a countrywide strike called by the opposition to press its demand for the government to resign ahead of an election next month. It was a latest strife sparked by anti-government protests in which dozens of buses and vehicles have been set on fire, with at least six people killed since October 28th, when an opposition rally turned violent. Fire service official Shail Jahan Shikhtar said that strike supporters set fire to three compartments of an express train. It was not immediately clear how many were aboard the train headed for the capital of Dhaka from the northern district of Netrokona when passengers saw the flames a short distance from its destination. With its top leaders either jailed or in exile, the opposition Bangladesh Nationalist Party wants Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina to step down and make way for a neutral government to oversee January 7th polls that it has boycotted. Hasina, who is seeking her fourth consecutive term of five, has repeatedly rebuffed the opposition's call to resign, blaming the BNP for the recent deadly street protests in support of their demand. Rights groups have accused the government of targeting opposition leaders and supporters. The government denies the accusations but face pressure from Western nations to hold free, fair and participatory elections. In line with the usual practice, Bangladesh's election panel has decided to deploy the army from December 29th to deter any violence. Jailed former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan has delivered a speech using an audio clip generated through artificial intelligence to address a virtual rally, the first event of its kind in the South Asian country. Pakistan's embattled former Prime Minister Imran Khan has delivered a rousing speech to his supporters from behind bars, using artificial intelligence to create a voice clone that has allowed the jail politician to campaign for his party months ahead of an expected general election. Khan has been locked up since August after he was found guilty of corruption. He is additionally accused of leaking classified documents, allegations the cricketer-turned-politician has repeatedly denied and says are intended to stop him from contesting nationwide polls expected in February. The country's media regulator banned television stations from broadcasting Khan's speeches after his brief arrest in May sparked deadly riots, prompting the government to shut down the internet for three days. Legal proceedings against Khan have taken place behind closed doors. There have been no image of Khan in jail or in court shared with the public since his arrest in August. His Pakistan Tariq e Insaf party held an online rally that lasted about seven hours, during which it released a roughly four minute clip that used AI technology to mimic Khan's voice. The audio was overlaid with old footage and photographs of the country's former leader. The AI voice said, quote, My fellow Pakistanis, first, I would like to praise my social media team for this historic attempt. Perhaps you're wondering what my condition is in jail. My determination for real freedom is strong. Our party is not allowed to hold public rallies. Our people are being kidnapped and families are being harassed. End quote. Khan swept to power in 2018 on an anti-corruption platform, a message that resonated with the country's youth, who analysts say has become disenfranchised by the political dynasties and military establishments that have ruled Pakistan for much of its more than seven decades in existence. Khan's virtual rally drew more than 1.4 million views on YouTube and was viewed live by tens of thousands on other social media platforms. Netblocks, an internet watchdog that monitors cybersecurity, said social media platforms were restricted in Pakistan for about seven hours during the PTI's virtual rally. The use of AI audio recording is being seen as an example of how AI technology has been used by politicians who say they are battling state suppression. An earthquake hit the northwestern Chinese province of Gansu yesterday night, leaving more than 100 people dead. 
Meanwhile, authorities are battling bitterly cold temperatures in a bid to prevent secondary disasters. A moderately strong earthquake struck the Gansu Qinghai border region of China late Monday night. The quake occurred at a depth of 35 kilometers, with its epicenter 102 kilometers west southwest of Gansu's provincial capital city, Lanzhou. According to state media, at least 111 people were killed and more than 230 injured. But official reports have not provided any information on any missing people in the quake's aftermath. Seismologists are reviewing available data regarding the earthquake's magnitude, which the U.S. Geological Survey put at 5.9. The European Mediterranean Seismological Center reported it a magnitude 6.1 quake, while Chinese state media said it registered at 6.2 magnitude. Additionally, Chinese state media reported that a total of nine aftershocks of magnitude 3.0 and above were recorded before dawn Tuesday. China's National Commission for Disaster Prevention, Reduction and Relief and its Ministry of Emergency Management have activated a level 4 disaster relief emergency response. China has a four-tier emergency response system for meteorological disasters, with level one being the most severe. Officials said there has been some damage to water, electricity, transportation, communications, and other infrastructure without providing further details. The disaster area is in a high-altitude region where temperatures of minus 14 degrees Celsius were recorded on Tuesday morning. Rescue efforts are underway to prevent secondary disasters caused by factors beyond the quake. Israel Hamas war updates now. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin reiterated the U.S.'s support of Israel in its war against Hamas at a joint press conference. Let's take a look. For days, there have been questions about America's ongoing support for Israel's war strategy. One of the purposes of this visit, to present a united front to the enemy and the world. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin reaffirming the U.S. is here to stay. Our commitment to Israel is unshakable. It follows comments from President Joe Biden that Israel is losing international support. Hamas says the death toll inside Gaza since October 7 is nearing 20,000. Protecting civilians, a key issue discussed in Tel Aviv, along with escalating hostilities on other fronts, including the Red Sea. Yemen's Houthi rebels, who've been attacking commercial vessels in recent weeks, targeting more, one of them British. This threatens the freedom of navigation of the entire world. Oil giant BP, the latest to stop all shipping via the Red Sea, fearing attacks by the Iranian proxy. America had requested an Australian warship be sent to the region, but it's understood more Defence Force personnel will be sent instead. Hamas has released a video of three elderly hostages, believed filmed under duress, calling for their release. As Israel urges caution to claims its snipers killed a mother and daughter at a church in Gaza City where hundreds were sheltering. This from the UK's most senior Catholic. It's certainly a cold-blooded killing. We do our best to conduct our operations as carefully and as professionally as possible. Latest U.S. presidential election updates on the road to the White House next. Recent polls have increased concerns among Democrats that President Joe Biden is losing young voters' support in the run-up to the November 2024 election. Here are several former supporters explaining why. I voted for Biden, and I told my friends to as well. Evan McKenzie is a Starbucks worker and union organizer in Madison, Wisconsin, who cast his very first presidential ballot for Joe Biden. The 23-year-old was part of the surge in young voters in the liberal Dane County that helped Biden flip the battleground state three years ago. He's now angry at the president over his support for Israel's invasion of Gaza. In 2020, Election Day exit polls showed young voters backed Biden over Donald Trump by more than 20 points. But a recent poll shows former President Trump leading this group by four percentage points and President Biden at risk of losing a key part of his winning coalition. 60% of young voters say they oppose more funding and military aid to Israel. Republican presidential candidates have also vocally supported Israel's campaign against Hamas, but it's President Biden's young progressive base that's been increasingly sympathetic to Palestinians. Supporting Mr. Biden is a conversation, sometimes a debate, that this group of Wisconsin friends say they are now having regularly. He has the lar largest infrastructure bill since Eisenhower. I mean, that's a huge thing. Not, not enthused. Uh, I'd say overall I feel very pragmatic and strategic about it. Young voters who can tip the balance in 2024 already weighing their options.
Welcome back. The tech giant Apple said that it would pause sales of its Series 9 and Ultra 2 smartwatches in the United States from this week as it deals with a patent dispute over the technology that enables the blood oxygen feature on the devices. Apple has been forced to halt sales of some smartwatches in the US. The tech giant said Monday that the move affected its top-end Series 9 and Ultra 2 models. It comes amid a patent dispute over technology that allows the watches to measure blood oxygen levels. US watchdogs have said that violates rights belonging to medical technology firm Massimo. In October, the US International Trade Commission said it could bar Apple from importing the watches as a result. That decision is now under review by President Joe Biden. If he doesn't overturn it, the ban will go into effect on December 26th. Apple says it's taking steps to comply already with the affected watches to go off sale before Christmas. Lower priced models that don't feature the blood oxygen sensor aren't affected and all versions will remain available outside the US. Massimo boss Joe Chiani has said he's open to a deal. In October he told that he was ready to negotiate with Apple. The iPhone maker says Massimo's moves are just a manoeuvre to clear a space in the market for its own competing smartwatch. An Iceland volcano in Grindavik has erupted as residents evacuated weeks before after a series of intense earthquakes jolted the area. You'd be forgiven for thinking it was the sun rising. In just seconds, it was as clear as day. And it was a sight to behold, whether it was out a window, from the tarmac, on the edge of town, the freeway, hanging from a helicopter, or through the lens of a drone. The crack is pouring out lava in all directions. It's currently 3.5 kilometres long, and it's growing. The eruption occurred just outside of Grindavik at 10.17pm and is less than a kilometre from a power plant. The small fishing town has sat empty since last month. 4,000 residents were evacuated following weeks of earthquakes and the expectation this would happen. The priority now is to protect lives and, where possible, property. For now, both are far from danger, meaning it's an early Christmas light show. North Korea has officially announced that yesterday's missile launch drill was for a Hwasong-18 solid fuel ICBM, and the regime's leader Kim Jong-un attended the launch. It's official. It was an intercontinental ballistic missile that Pyongyang fired on Monday. The North State-run Korean Central News Agency reported on Tuesday that the regime on Monday conducted a, quote, launch drill of a Hwasong-18 solid fuel ICBM. It also reported that the North's leader Kim Jong-un attended the launch and said its success sends a clear message to the hostile forces about what action and option North Korea is ready to take if, quote, Washington makes a wrong decision. The KCNA also reported that the loud advertising of the U.S. nuclear-powered submarine USS Missouri, which arrived in the South Korean port city of Busan on Sunday, is an extremely provocative move that's gravely threatening to North Korea's regional and environmental stability. Pyongyang wants to say that it has the upper hand when it comes to the military issue on the Korean peninsula. The regime also wants to stress that all ROK-US joint military exercises are to bring an end to the North regime. That's why it's saying it wants to strengthen its deterrence by taking strong countermeasures, including a preemptive nuclear strike. The Hwasong-18 especially is an ICBM, so the fact that Kim Jong-un was there might be aimed at sending some kind of message to the US. A South Korean Unification Ministry official told reporters on Tuesday that it is North Korea that has been continuously developing various strategic weapons while stating its nuclear forces policy and its constitution. The official said Pyongyang tries to justify its nuclear missile development plans by shamelessly blaming the South Korea-U.S. alliance while repeatedly ignoring U.N. Security Council resolutions. 
Egypt's President Abdul Fattah al-Sisi has won a third six-year term with 89.6% of the vote. The former army chief beat three low-profile candidates with the runner-up securing only 4.5%. Egypt's faltering economy and the war in Gaza were key electoral issues. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has won a third term in an election where he faced no serious challenges and garnered nearly 90% of votes. According to election authorities on Monday, Sisi called the result a rejection of the inhumane war in neighboring Gaza. Some voters said the eruption of conflict in Gaza had encouraged them to vote for Sisi, who presents himself as a bulwark of stability in a volatile region. That argument has also proved persuasive to Gulf and Western allies, who provide financial support to his government. Egyptians voted on December 10th to 12th. The state and tightly controlled domestic media pushed hard to boost turnout in the poll, which the election authority said had reached 66.8%, above the 41% recorded at the last presidential election in 2018. The election featured three other candidates, none of them high profile. The most prominent potential challenger halted his run in October, saying officials and thugs had targeted his supporters. Accusations dismissed by the election authority. Many people in the Arab world's most populous country expressed indifference about the election, saying the result was a foregone conclusion. His reporters witnessed voters being bussed into some polling stations and bags of food being handed out, while some voters said they were offered financial incentives. The state media body said any provision of money or goods in return for votes was a criminal offence. Sisi, a former general, has overseen a sweeping crackdown on dissent across the political spectrum since he led the overthrow of Egypt's first democratically elected leader, Mohamed Morsi of the Egyptian Brotherhood, in 2013. Welcome back. Unprecedented heavy rainfall battered South India today. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world in a minute. Severe flooding in India's Tamil Nadu following heavy rainfall that has pounded the region over several days. Vehicles were seen moving through inundated roads next to entirely flooded areas. The United States will run out of funds for Ukraine this month if the Congress fails to approve additional aid bills before the end of this year, the White House has warned yesterday. The official death toll of the explosion at an oil terminal in Guinea's capital, Konaki, rose to at least 13 with 178 injured as firefighters worked through the afternoon to fully extinguish the blaze. China said that the Philippines was responsible and had entirely caused recent incidents between vessels from the two nations in the South China Sea. Congolese President Felix Tshisekedi threatened to declare war on Rwanda during his final election rally in Kinshasa, Congo. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Tonight, we're leaving you in Croatia as five million colored lights brought Christmas cheer to Croatian town Grabovinka. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.